gentlemen, what the world has been waiting for, what the world needs now, the one, the only, amazing, original, Jenny Blaze, often imitated, but never duplicated, there's Jenny! Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you all to the amazing original Johnny Blake show. It's always great to be here as I blaze right in with my karate kick. <clears throat> Let's have a blazing hot fun time. Why do sharks never attack entertainment lawyers out of professional courtesy? What do you call a bunch of millionaires sitting around watching the Super Bowl on TV? The Dallas Cowboys. A man was walking down the street when an angel appeared before him. I am your guardian angel. You may ask any three questions you want. The man asked, how long is one million earth years in, in, in heaven? About one second, the angel replied. How much is one million dollars worth in heaven? Asked the man. Well, less than one penny, replied the angel. Can you give me one million dollars? The man asked. Yes, said the angel. You will get the money in about one second. <laughs> Last night, a man pulled a gun on me, and he said, give me your money or your life. And I told him, I don't think you want my life. I've been divorced twice and audited by the IRS, and all my credit cards are maxed out. But you can have all the Burger King coupons in my wallet. The man put his gun down and ran away. We have a blazing hot fun show with a special guest. He is a multi-talented and award-winning comedian, writer, and podcast host. Please give a big warm welcome and say hello to Mark Yaffe. Welcome to the amazing original Johnny Blaze Show. Hey, some minor te technical difficulties on my end, but that's not surprising. Oh, really? If okay. you know me. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, I, I turn passwords into Rubik's Cubes. It's the simplest thing, so. Well, that's like turning your scars into stars, right? <laughs> there you go. Well, you're, you're doing great. Look at, look at great there, uh, Mark. It's a little late here. I'm in, uh, I'm in the Midwest, so I'm, hopefully the bags aren't showing yet. Feel good, though. Oh, oh, I see. No, they're not showing at all. I, I wouldn't even notice it. If you hadn't said anything, I wouldn't have noticed it. <laughs> You're looking fine. Anyway, Mark, uh, yeah, give, give me a rundown. Tell me about the Mark Yaffe story. How did you get started in entertainment? Where are you from? Okay, well, I'm originally from Los Angeles. Grew up in uh, San Fernando Valley. Uh, t 20 minutes from, you know, Hollywood and... Uh, all the studios, half hour from all that stuff. Then I moved to the middle of uh, the woods in Northern California, working for the state of California. Got burned out on that. I used to be a DMV driving examiner. So my buddy said, open, open a driving school and started teaching traffic classes. And people uh, liked my comedy and they thought I was funny doing the classes. And they said, oh, you should do stand-up comedy. So I said, well, I'll hire some comedians went to Sacramento to a club just to try to recruit some comics, end up taking a class. And uh, here, I, here I am 24 years later in the 50-year plan. Wow. So start off in, in comedy at traffic school. Wow. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. Usually comedians back in the day when it was a thing in the you know 90s, early 2000s, comedians would do traffic school on the side as like, a, you know, extra side hustle. In addition, you know, during the day, make some extra money. I did it backwards. I did, I did traffic school first, then then started doing stand up comedy. So, well, I remember that. You know, if I ever got a ticket and uh, I listened to other uh, comedians, they're not <laughs> they're not sit down, but they're stand up comedians like yourself, and they they make me laugh and they make me forget about the troubles that I uh, I have for getting the ticket. So well, it's it, it's a win win situation. It works out for everybody. You could have had Richard Pryor in there. You know, eight hours of traffic school. It's, it's still a tough tough day. You know, I don't care if it's I'll get the kid. But, you know, you make it tolerable for people and, and the fact that they, you know, saw you had some humanity and a sense of humor about it and, and didn't take it, you know, totally serious. You weren't some uh, angry uh, cop working part time yelling at him for getting uh, for being bad drivers. So, yeah, it was it was a good learning curve. That's for sure. You know, you get 25, 30 people in there and, and try to. That was certainly where I learned crowd management, I think, and, and how to deal with uh, – that was my first experience with hecklers, or as we called them, students back then. That's what I'm going to ask you also. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with hecklers as a, as a, as a competent, successful uh, a tr uh, comedian? You know, you know, I've been fortunate. I don't really have too many problems with hecklers. Very rarely. I, I work – I have a pretty fast pace in my cadence, and I think people – 
feel either either they're hesitant to jump in if they're thinking about it, or I just don't give them a lot of breathing room to do it. But you know, I try to I try to uh, kind of diffuse them. You know, some comics it's pretty much they just want to uh, you know do a, do a one punch knockout on the heckler. If you come at a heckler too strong, you can turn the audience against you pretty easily. You know, if it's a if it's an unequal uh, application of force. You know, so I I, I try to kind of you know just joke with them at first, try to keep it friendly, and if they get persistent, then it may be able to start hammering down on them. But uh, you know, fortunately, it hasn't hasn't been uh, too big a problem over the years. So it sounds like you just let it roll off right off your ears or your shoulders and act like it's no big thing, right? Yeah, I mean, it kind of addresses it too. I think if they're, it really depends on how persistent people are. If it's a one time, they chirp up or they're talking, but then they stop. And you really have to read what's the what's the person doing? Are they intent on disrupting the show? Are they overly enthusiastic cheering your show? We did a show one time at uh, in uh, Scottsdale at. Uh, uh, the Salt River Pima a Casino, Arizona, and there was a whole group of special needs people. They put them right up front, and they were just having the best time. But they weren't totally conscious of like the the pacing of the show. So I'd be doing a setup, and they'd be just laughing their heads up before I'd even told the joke. And they didn't mean anything by it. They just in their in their you know world where they were at, they were just having a good old time. So it was it, it, so I certainly couldn't start tearing into them. I would really had the audience turn on me, you know, this guy picking on special needs adults at the front row. So right. you don't want them turning against you. You want them working. You want them smiling and laughing with you, not at you, right? Yeah, you need you need an audience on your side. That's really you know, say it's some comics, I'll be honest, some people that's their their thing. They want to see, okay, how many people can I walk? Can I piss off the audience? And it's like I mean, at the end of the day, we're 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 service industry. I mean, we're, we're they pay money for us to entertain them, not to piss them off and go bug the venue for a refund. So I don't see how that's a win-win for anyone. It might be a good ego boost, but uh, certainly that's not that my intention when I got on stage to walk people. I just hey, I want to stick around afterward, buy stuff. That's you know, they walk out, they're not buying anything after, they're not uh, you know trying to get your social media and stay in touch and. You know, it's it's that's definitely not a win. That's a lose lose in that situation. Right. Yeah. You want people cheering and applauding. You don't want people jeering and 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 booing. You don't want that. No, or or just you know cussing you out and storming out of the club. Yeah, right. You have never had that experience. Have you? You've never had. Well, oh, I've had a few years? walkouts over the years, and people say, ah, you know, they just left early. They weren't into it. Sure, you know, I've had my share of bad shows, but not, not too much. I mean, it's it's not. I never had a group walkout either. I've seen that happen where, you know, a comedian has uh, gotten super controversial and I could walk the table or something like that. But uh, I've, I've been uh, I've been pretty fortunate in my. Uh, so you've never had any real embarrassing experiences in all your in all your career? Oh, I'm sure I, I'm sure I have. I mean, this as far as the audience walk, I just horrible shows. But I think people saw, you know, this guy, oh, this guy's not a bad guy. And they were just like, oh, you know. And that just put us out of our misery. You know, I've done shows. We did uh, an overseas uh, armed forces entertainment tour in uh, Okinawa. And they had a, uh, it was a hurricane, not a hurricane, they call them typhoon over there. And they re- they just locked us in the hotel, gave us a bunch of food, said, hey, we'll get a hold of you in two or three days. So our show got rescheduled. And the rescheduled show, uh, four people showed up in like a 275 seat room. Well, that's terrible. That's so it's painful, painful. But you know, you had to do the show. They were still there, so you get these painful, painful experiences. And it's more the fact that, like, you know, you do a gig, you drive to the middle of nowhere, and then the the check bounces. It's like the the usually the the more work there is to get the gig, the more trouble there is at the gig. Yeah, it just seems to kind of have its momentum, either in the in the positive or the negative sense. So. Well, it's like the old saying, it's a little cliche, if, if, if anything go wrong, Canada it will, Murphy's Law. Uh, you, you've ever had a show where you tried your best? You're trying, all right, very trying, but nothing seemed to work out no matter what. Oh, there's been a few of those. You know, that, I, I just call that punch the clock comedy at that point. You just do your time. You get to that 45 minutes, and it's like, okay, that's 44 minutes and 59 seconds, and uh, have a good evening. And, you know, you don't you don't have to stick, you don't stick around. Because I'm probably not going to sell anything. And then sometimes it's like, the audience was enjoying themselves, but there's a social kind of cue and no one really kind of uh, connected. They were enjoying it individually. It's, there's a, such a synergy of comedy, but 
afterward they'll come up and say, "Oh, that was a great show." I was like, "Well, you uh, are you were you at the show here? You really didn't uh, have much. Uh, you really you weren't very demonstrative about it. So you never know." <laughs> okay. Well, there must be something about it that's very rewarding for you. I mean, you know. Because it's not an easy thing to be a comic, I'm sure. I'm sure there's a lot involved in timing and writing writing jokes and trying to everything's gotta just fit just right. You gotta and remembering things and how do you even handle it? What if you forget? What if you forget your lines? How do you deal with that? Uh, you know, you just you can start I all start talking to the audience. You're always like thinking the next joke ahead as you're saying the current joke. It's weird, your brain goes in like split mode. So uh yeah, that's a that's a weird feeling. What what'll happen, like say uh, if I work maybe in the Laugh Factory in Las Vegas, there's two shows a night for seven nights. Day five or six, you've repeated that show. You know, you don't remember like, okay, did I do this joke already? You start to starts to blur together. That's a frightening thing. So, I don't think I repeated the joke yet, but I felt like I had. Yeah. So, it's it's a lot of just uh, really just trying to stay present and not get too much into your head about. Uh, uh, overanalyzing the joke. Sometimes you have to flow it, and then maybe you just have to work the audience and just, just break out of just the, the set. You just have to have a way. To, that's the thing is diving, jumping in and out of a set because I have a certain flow. My one segment flows and segues into another and into another. So it's kind of like these trigger, you know, uh, phrases and things that took, no, I know where I'm going next. So if you, if you have to step out of that, that can that can be a little... Uh, uh, yeah, what if you're distracted? What if you forget something, then... How do you yeah, do but you know what? People really like when, when things kind of goes, I don't want to say south, when they go spontaneous, something happens in the audience and an interaction with a, a, the waiter or the server or the one of the audience members. When they see you coming up with jokes on, and they know it, well, this isn't scripted. I had a lady fall asleep uh, at, a, at a theater show like a month ago in Holland, America Cruise. And so I got, got in the show. I, I walked off the stage. I went up there. And I just pretend I was hypnotizing her, and then we were just clowning her the whole time. She was passed out drunk. Really? So the rest of the time, you know, like after the show, I said, oh, so that lady works with you, huh? Because people were laughing and all. They thought it was just some sort of a gimmick. And I said, no, I never met the lady in my life. Just, and then she had to deal with the stigma of the rest of the, the cruise. She was like uh, the lady that passed out in the theater during the show, so everyone knew her. <laughs> you know, oh, because of you. She became famous. Well, known, right? <laughs> yeah, she became infamous. There you go. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's fantastic. You you, you you made her you made her smile. That's for sure. You, you turned well, her around and she, she was smiling. She didn't. She, I don't know if she was smiling. I'm glad she didn't complain because she was like I said. She was just. Well, she was totally passed out. So. Oh, but the the rest of the audience is having a great time, and then I right, started. The other audience was they were enjoying. Yeah, it, right. So it really became a crowd work show at that point. I done made fun of her and clowning at people, and I really couldn't go back to my set. So we pretty much just talked and joked, and I did a little better, you know. My my show just to close it out, but uh, yeah, I mean spontaneity and people like the the you know that's everything now we're a reality, inst instantaneous, on the spot type of uh, uh, mindset in America. So people like that, you know, is this is this happening in real time? Is this I, I want to unscript it? I want in in a minute. I want it right happening as it, so, you know, a lot of comics now they don't even want to do material. They just want to do crowd work. I think you know some people say that's the future of comedy, I and mean, I think I think it'll be somewhat of a hybrid. You might have to talk to people more because they want to be included. Everybody, you know, it's all about inclusion. You have audience participation. Do you actually go out in the crowd and have audience participation on your shows? Once in a while, I'm not I'm not known for that. I might start doing more of it if that's where it's headed. You know, you got to comedy's evolved. You know, you think you know you've probably been to a comedy show 20, 30 years ago. It'd be guys doing character voices and accents and you know there's a lot of that stuff you can't do now you know there's there's it's 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 uh a new a new uh variation of of old you don't just do da 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 da, -da joke da -da, da 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 joke it's more storytelling it's more um uh free flow and 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 then people want more spontaneous so what's your favorite what's your favorite you've done many shows how many shows have you done and what is your favorite all time time one that really stood out that's Wow. Very, okay. Let's see, 1999. Uh, how many? How many shows? Yeah. I'd say I've probably done uh, close to 3,000 shows. Wow, that's quite a bit. My favorite, probably the uh, overseas uh, armed forces entertainment tours. Yeah. Um, 
I think my favorite stood out just because it was so uh, odd was um, we did the Fifth Fleet Naval Headquarters in Bahrain in the Middle East. And we show up, it's two in the morning, and the guy, it's the middle of the, it's still during the Iraq War, a lot of anti American sentiment. They had death to America in the bathroom of the plane, like graffiti. And we get off in Bahrain, which is about five minutes by cruise missile to Iraq, a uh, little island there. So we get off the plane, and then this guy picks us up, doesn't speak in English, just had a sign with our name. They drop us outside of the base, like 100, 200 yards away. You can see the front gate. And there's all this, you know, these uh, barriers and, you know, things to dissuade uh, suicide bombers. And we're like, well, we'd really like to be on the base. But the next day we wake up and our show's not till that night. We've traveled, you know, halfway around the world. And we see all these signs. We show up, Robin Williams, 0100, uh, Dallas Cowboy Cheerleaders, uh, Blake Edwards, like this huge USO show. So they have, you know, Robin Williams shows up. He drops in by helicopter. They probably had like 3,000 people show up. And then we had to do a show that night. They, no one evidently coordinated this, so that was last minute. And, and we had about three or 400 people still. So that was, you know, just the fact that we still had people come out. That was super gratifying. And stayed friends with a couple of those guys since. And we had a bunch of food coupons. They came up to the uh, their little food court. And uh, we brought them all in W root beer and hung out and just. Uh, well, that's an unforgettable experience. You really loved it. Yeah. Oh yeah, I spent a lot of that, that a lot of those, uh, and some painful ones too. You do some of the armed forces entertainment. Yeah. Forces, you like, you I was going to ask you about that. What is the opposite now? What is one that you want to? Uh, that's well, that one I told you about that with yeah. the typhoon when there was only four people was one. Oh, that's the okay. Yeah, and then. Uh, had to do a breakfast one. I didn't tell. I don't think they put up the signage till like five minutes before the chow. They did. We did a show in the mess hall at like eight in the morning. It's like <laughs> these guys just waking up. They got a duty. They got all the stuff on their mind. They weren't. It wasn't really a good time for for trying to get people to laugh, especially when they're eating and walking out. Of the, you know, walking by you with the tray full of food. And it was like it was. It was. Uh, I wouldn't say it was a throwaway show, but it was pretty close. I see. Well, so there's all kinds. There's all kinds of experiences. There's an old saying, you know, like you've really old in the banana peel theory. If you see someone slipping up a banana peel, it's hilarious. But if it happens to you, it's not so funny, right? You ever had any experiences like that where you saw somebody, somebody had a, you know, they tripped on something or whatever? Oh, you mean like an audience member? Right. Or even yourself, right? Yeah. I almost, well, I did this TV taping for Showtime, uh, Going Native. It was a first all native stand up special. And I came off the stage, and there was a step. I didn't see it. And they edited it. I tripped. I almost went flying flat on my face. I just caught myself at the last second. Wow. 500 people in the theater. And it's like, oh, man, that would have just been the worst. If I'd face planted or busted a tooth or, you know, <laughs> stood up and, you know, jaws displaced. So that that was the closest I came to, like, a disaster situation. But, yeah, there's always... There's always close calls. I had to, you know, one time I'm in Topeka, Kansas. I had to go, I had to stop the show. I had to pee so bad. I had to stop. I said, okay, I made a joke. Like, okay, you guys are going to time me. We'll take bets. You know, what, what are you guys saying? How, how long will this take? And, you know, so that's that was an awkward situation. I was, thank God I'd have to shit. I was just, I just had to pee. So. <laughs> yeah, right in the middle of the show, you have to go, <laughs> that's difficult. How do you hold it in? I mean, eventually you can't hold it, right? You got to let it out. Well, you know what's weird? I don't know if you, maybe you have this with your show. Like, you ever have like you have an upset stomach or you feel like you have to go to the bathroom? But then you get in that show mode and it literally the brain just overrides that and generally not a problem. You know? Oh, yeah. I had, I had food poisoning one time. I had to do a show. This guy's like, hey, threw up for like a day and a half before the show. And he said, well, if you want to get paid, you got to do the show. Felt fine or tolerable during the show. Went back to the room and you know, continued my <laughs> bout with uh, food poisoning. In other words, the show goes on. The show must go on. What you're saying. <laughs> I say, how do you say the show must go on? The checks must get, must go out. Yeah. So right. yeah. Oh yeah, your expenses. You still got to you still got to pay your bills. Not gonna, people are not going to say, well, you know, we feel sorry for you. You're not feeling so good. We still want. Yeah. You know, this 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 is a job. There's no retirement benefits. There's no sick pay. There's no union. There's no workers' rights. You, you show up at a gig that can be canceled. I've had that happen. And they canceled. Oh yeah. We oh we sent an email. Oh, you know what? Doesn't happen too often, but it's happened. 
Oh yeah, well, I understand. I've had people cancel on me on me. That's why I do several final confirmations because I just had somebody who was a comedian, another comedian, and he acted so interested. He had a best-selling book, and he was excited. And all of a sudden, when I told him the times, what did he say? I'm I'm sorry, it's too late. <laughs> Or I've had people that are scheduled and some of them don't even show up. No call, no show. I mean, that's terrible. You know? No, no, that's unprofessional. That's part of you know, Oh, yeah, that's right. So the minute, I was going to feel sorry for me. The minute that guy conked out, I immediately went forward to try to get somebody else. And fortunately, I connected. So, you know, I'm, you know, I'm working with different people. I'm working with entertainment publicists always help. And, uh, you know, some podcast groups and things like that. You know, and networking and everything. You always got to do those kind of things. Yeah. I'm sure you do, too. I'm sure you've come up with... Uh, connections and different uh, people that you uh, hit it off with and help you. Yeah. Some people are pretty, you know, pretty helpful. It's amazing. I don't know if this is just cruise ships. I've, I I think the, the, the help rate where people say they're going to do something for you, at least for me, maybe it's, I'm a personality repellent or something they're like really sincere. Oh yeah. Yeah. We want to help maybe 2% follow up, maybe five. If I'm being generous. Yeah. Now, the two and five have been very generous and have done, you know, but a lot of people see on the ship, all, oh, yeah, I want to get you, I got a casino, oh, we got to this, oh, we want to get you here, never hear from them. Yeah, yeah, give us your number, oh, yeah, you'll be hearing from us. Well, it's not, you know what, it's not the, it's, don't talk about it, be about it, don't just talk, it's not what you say, it's what you do, it's your actions. Like they say, oh, if it costs people more money to talk, they keep their mouth shut, that's the millions of dollars, right? Yeah. Actions. Anybody can say they're going to do this, they're going to do that. Are they going to fall through? Are they going to, are they going to fall through or fall through or, or fall down? Either, yeah. either you do or you don't. That's all. <laughs> but there's all oh, yeah. I, I, take, I hate to say I take everything with a grain of salt because you really want to have a, a positive attitude that, that things are going to happen. But at the same time, you have to you got to be a little jaded if you've been doing this as long as I have, you know, that you don't expect things aren't always going to go, you know, when someone makes a promise or something, I have control of things on stage. I only can worry about the things I can control. You know, my my schedule, my my abilities, and my uh, you know uh, business practices and, and disciplines. But everything else, everyone else is you know wild card. You don't know. Yeah. Well, I saw that you had quite a few gigs lined up, and that's why I wanted to make sure. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I gave you a confirmation. I'm going to do a final confirmation, so you didn't forget, or maybe something else come up. No, I appreciate uh, that. I actually had to write and I wrote notes today because I usually, like you said, it's usually we don't do this that this late. So I made sure I had two or three notes that just reminded me. Uh, late show at uh, 11 p.m. Yeah. Well, you're, you know, you're, yeah, you know what, you're, uh, yeah, you're on your toes. That's for sure. Yeah. You know what you're doing, Mark. Here at the beautiful yeah. Sleep Inn in Omaha, Nebraska, living the dream. <laughs> Open out in Nebraska. That's is that is that where you're living right now? No, I'm doing a show out here in Omaha. So. Oh, you are okay. I think yeah. I some of that on your schedule, Omaha. Nebraska. Uh, yeah, I did Omaha, and I was in Lincoln tonight, and I'm doing a thing over in Shenandoah, Elk, uh, uh, Iowa, because my career keeps going places I never dreamed. You've been in what about 43 states that I read and read about you? Yeah, 43 states, 11 countries. And uh, trying to get those other seven states knocked out. You know, you know anyone in Kentucky? No, I don't. I've never been to Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. I think when I was a kid, but I, I haven't done Kentucky or Mississippi, Louisiana, wow. South Carolina. I think New Hampshire. No, I've done New Hampshire, Vermont. I have to go to Vermont and Maine, and yeah, knock those off the list. But, so you've tra you've toured all over. You've done all kinds of shows. You've done clubs and tell me about talk to me about the different clubs and the tours that you've experienced and everything and the ones that stand out. Uh, if you've done so many of them. Oh man, I you know, uh, it's been so up and down. This is, I'd say my some of the highlights. We did a, a all native tour. It's called Powell Comedy Jam, and that was a lot of fun because uh, that was the first time there'd been like a touring Native American show and. People were real, especially Native people were really wild about it, and they came out and supported big time. But there were some personality clashes that all kind of unraveled. We ended up getting a chapter, a whole chapter about us in a book about Native comedy. Uh, this uh, um, comedy writer, Kip Nesterhoff, he's written like three or four books on, uh, he's a comedy historian. He did a pretty good job, you know, but uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, um, Done the clubs, yeah. I mean, I haven't done do that much clubs now. I did more more uh, 
cruise ships and and uh, casinos, but uh, it's it's a variation. That's what I like about it. It's like, hey, I might do an all tribal event, then I might do an all ages event, then I might do an almost dead event, which is some of the cruise ships. The average age is you know uh, cremated. No. Let's see. What what you know? You've been on, on many cruises. You've done standing. Which cruises are uh, and where and when did you do some of these uh, cruises? Talk to me and tell me about that. I, I work for uh, Holland America and Carnival Cruise Lines. I've done some Princess Cruise Lines. So I've nice. been doing that since 2018. And yeah, I'll be 10, 15 weeks a year. So I'm starting to do a little more. So you get to travel and you get to do your craft. That's that's a yeah. one fun. And, and the ships are just super convenient. You think about like here, I had to go to Dallas. Uh, from Columbia to get here. I got stuck in an ice storm. I couldn't leave uh, the hotel for a day and a half. I couldn't fly to the airport, so the flights had canceled. And then, you know, I had to get here. And then my ride, which I thought the other comedian, I arranged a ride. She goes, well, I live in Lincoln. I don't live in Omaha. Well, I'm staying in Omaha. She, we, we never thought, I just assumed she was in Omaha. So I had to end up renting a car. You know, see, have a, it's just, Stuff unexpected things pop up, so that can be a little exhausting. Whereas you get on the ship, everything's you're going to be at this show this time here here. They take care of your travel. They figure out this and that. You just you know have a ten minute you know that ten they minute. Your, they pay for your travel. Hours. You get the food and everything else. You get all yeah. those. That's fantastic. Yeah, you, you and then maybe a forty five second walk to work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You don't worry about driving or or flying. No, no traffic, no ice storms, no rental cars breaking down. I just came back on right now on the freeway. Car spun out, headlights pointing at me on the freeway. I'm like, oh my god, I got some drunk driver. I'm like, I was spun. They crashed. The the cars looked pretty intact, so I kept going. It didn't look like no one was on fire. It was. I didn't want to be late for the show, so I just want you to know there's some people on the the I-80 in Omaha that uh, did get my my uh, my assistance because I didn't want to be late. Cruises are fun. They are fun. I've been on about 13 different cruises. I actually met on a Royal Caribbean uh, one time. I met a comedian, and I actually ended up uh, having him on my show. Oh, uh, you remember his name? Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to remember now. Um, uh, Ed the Machine Regime. That's his name. I know Ed. Yeah. You know Ed? Yeah. yeah. He's a good guy. He's a great Just guy. He's from Vegas. We, he used to run the uh, a room in Simi Valley. Um yeah, he was at, I went to see him in Chimney Valley at a place called Jan Arth Comedy Club that time. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I did it with him right before he moved to Vegas. He, he lives in Vegas now. Oh, he lives in Vegas now? Yeah. I didn't know he moved because he was living, I think, in Chatsworth or something, and now he's he moved to Vegas. I didn't know that. Yeah, a lot of comics have moved to Vegas. It's, it's crazy. Bro. Wow. Well, I think in the last two or th- you know, last five years, seven years, probably, I know at least a dozen, two dozen comics have moved there. Well, I see. Well, that's fantastic. Um, I moved no, to Reno. Know. Vegas got punked. So that's where I'm at. Yeah. So you've done some shows in Vegas? Yeah. I've worked at uh, MGM, uh, Brad Garrett, MGM. Uh, I work at the Laugh Factory. Mm-hmm. done a couple of corporate shows. I get the Bellagio and mm-hmm. performed at a couple of conferences there. Yeah. You know, not, not, I'm not a super regular there, so I can't say I'm like locked in in Vegas, but I get there. Enough to, you know. That must be fun. Yeah, I had a guy by the name of Tony Pace as a previous guest. He's a Vegas headliner. And he and he demonstrated to me, his, uh, he did some, it's better to be impressed instead of depressed. He, so he did his impressions. By the, do you have any Do you have any also ways of impressing me with impressions instead of depressions? I do a little Dr. Phil. That's about it. That's about it. That's all that's I it, huh? Dr. Mm-hmm. Phil. Huh? Dr. Then Phil. I do Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton's basically Dr. Phil with a little bit scratch your voice. Oh. Well, yeah, that's it. I always wanted to be an impressionist too, dude. I was when I was a kid. I'm like, man, I want to do voices, and I can imitate so many non-celebrities. I can do friends, family, but I don't have the celebrities down. I'm working on some COVID, uh, kind of a wrap-up thing on COVID. I'm I'm working on a Trump, but it's it's just it's just sad, so sad. It's just I can't get it. It's in the throat. It's in the throat. I don't have it. Well, very very frustrating. You have to have a feel for it. Yeah. Everybody's yeah, gonna have it, but I'm gonna get there. It's 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 going. I'm going to practice. Trust me. Tr- it's it's gonna be the best Trump impression when I come back next time. Have me on. You'll you'll do Guaranteed. it. 
Yeah. I have faith in you. I'm sure. I'm sure you'll do it, Mark. <laughs> of course, you'll do it, Mark. Of course. But the mind it may not be very. Mind. Hey, it may not be very good, but I'll do it. <laughs> well, I was trying to joke about how he did the, uh, the, uh, not to get political because I mean that's not my you know, not my intention. But he, I, I did look forward to the press conferences during COVID because he, 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 you know, he was like battling with the Dr. Burks and Fauci. You could just see he was like always oh, pissed. I was waiting for him to get up there one time. Dr. Burks, Dr. Fauci, you're fired. Oh, you got my Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. Right. Effective immediately, I'm replacing Dr. Burks and Dr. Fauci with Dr. Seuss and Dr. Doolittle. Something else. Uh, so we'll get there. Working on it. Oh, yeah, you're doing it. <laughs> never say never. You can always, you can do it. Just a matter of practice, a matter of time. Oh, yeah. That's fantastic. That's, you're doing it. You're doing it. <laughs> um, yeah, there are so many people that are great comics. Who has inspired you? I mean, is there any favorite ones like Robert Williams? There's, there's been all kinds of great I comics. I got to meet Robert Williams a few times. He used to come to uh, Throckmorton Theater in uh, um, Mill Valley because he lived there. And, and he had some he had some compliment. He complimented me a couple times on my sets. That was kind of nice. I don't think we really had an in-depth conversation, but, you know, he was friendly enough. Got to meet Robin. Met Dana Carvey a few times there and at uh, some other Rich, shows. Rich Little, did you ever meet him? Rich Little. Rich, met Rich Little at Laugh Factory, yeah. Really? That's fantastic. Yeah, that time he was John, Johnny Carson. He was imitating Johnny Carson. Phenomenal. And yeah. he's doing Richard Nixon. He's doing a little bit of everybody. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, he's still going. And he, he has a, uh, I think he does Biden a little bit too. Biden's not an easy one. I don't think there's not too many comics that Biden down. That's true. That's true. Yeah. He did Dana Carvey. He did Richard Nixon. I think he did Haldeman. He did a bunch of them. The way he did Carson was phenomenal. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I think that really put him on the made a good Carson. Uh, and then Nixon, his Nixon was because he kind of looked like Nixon too. He could check oh, yeah. jowls, so that was part of it. Yeah. Oh yeah. What do you th now? What do you think about the uh, the talent competitions? You know, things like um, American Idol, America's Got Talent, uh, The Voice, things like that. There used to be also a uh, um, I'm trying to think of that. There was um, oh, last comic standing. Last comic standing. That's the one I was. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, I think about it. There's no springboard anymore. It's so diluted and with social media and streaming, and so that's one way people, you know, actually get a national foothold is to win one of those contests, or or at least make a splash and get pretty high up in the contest. My uh, Friend Mikey Winfield just I think he just got the golden buzzer or something on America's Got Talent All Stars. So I think he won that. I don't think yeah. he won the America's Got Talent, but I think he won the All Star one. That was the first one. Oh, really? There. I never seen anybody in a comic win the whole thing. Totally. No. There was but a I guy that was he, handicapped, but he was you Yeah, know, Josh Blue. Yeah. yeah, Josh Blue with the stuttering and everything. Um but he he's used but the thing is he gets people to laugh and it's he makes fun of his of, of his disabilities. So he turns he turns the negative into a positive and it makes it funny. Well, that's what you do. Yeah, yeah you got to laugh at yourself. I don't care if you know if you have a disability like his or something. You know, I laugh about. I got jokes about having a big head and as a baby I couldn't hold my head up. And um, but my mom had an easy delivery because I'm adopted. So talking about my you know your physical malformities or you know the kind of oddities you kind of kind of want to talk about those, especially if it's something like Josh's where it's pretty obvious and hard to. To hide, yeah. What do you think about comedians like Rodney Dangerfield was great, or Don Rickles? Don Rickles was a master of sarcasm. Well, I I always tell people I saw him one of his last shows before he passed away. It was pretty cool. He was always working in uh, Laughlin, and he was right next door at the um, event center. Who so, talking about Rodney or Dangerfield, or are you talking about Don Rickles? No, uh, Rickles. Oh, Rickles, okay. And you can see, it's, you know, he was like ninety something, and he slowed way down, and they had a guy with a He's holding the microphone, and this guy's like tethering him. Like if he goes too far, he got pulled on the microphone to bring him back, so he wouldn't get too close to the edge of the stage, I guess. And then at the end of the show, they just like wrapped him in a robe and just hustled him off. It was kind of sad in a way. It's like yeah, because he was really want to be here. Are you just yeah, are you just exploiting? I don't, is this elder abuse or is this where he wants to be right now? I don't. I couldn't tell. He would be putting people down. I mean, you know, really be a. Uh sarcastic of putting people down wriggles, but he was a man. Well, it, it's plus you're, yeah, because people, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit safe space era now and people don't like to be attacked or, or un, un, unprovoked, unprovokedly uh, uh, singled out. And then a lot of his stuff would be, you know, uh, ethnic, you know, um, 
He'd like to say, oh, yeah, yeah, the black, the, the black, see my, my guy, my black guitarist, Tony, is, yeah, his friend's robbing your room right now. Like, you know, like the stereotype, oh, all black people are, are thieves. It's really not. So he gets away with it because it's an older crowd. If he was just coming on the scene now, he'd be, he'd be canceled pretty quick. You well, know, you know Nichols, you know, he made it, he made it really big. I mean, oh, yeah. yeah. How about, you know, you're, okay, and Rodney Dangerfield, I don't get any respect. I got to die. I can dial the operator and nobody will answer me. Something like that, you know. Yeah. I can't even even I value operator, they're just not gonna they don't they don't want anything to do with me. Yeah. I get all the disrespect that I, I guess that I deserve more respect. <laughs> you know, you put clutches in his tie and everything, it's funny. Roddy did you feel? Yeah. I called nine one one. Even even nine one one won't take my call. <laughs> right. That type of thing. Yeah, he was he was great. Oh yeah, there's so many of them out there. Yeah, or, or Richard Pryor. Oh, there's, there's many of them. There's many comics. Yeah, a lot of lot of talented comedians, and I think you know comedy is kind of a uh, in a renaissance right now. I think that's good. It's super popular. A lot of places are doing it. Um, it's a little bit of oversaturation, but you know it beats beats there not being enough work. So. I had an experience once at the LA Cabaret. I'll be over to that Encino. I went there. Uh, there was a comedian, an actress, and a comedian who was on a show that I was on. When I had a special, uh, her name is Pam Madison. She's no longer alive now, but remember she was with a guy, there's used car sales, but she was putting me down saying, oh, I'm calling me a husband. I should have high fived her and said, well, that's good. That's a compliment. That means if I once, if I wasn't anymore, I was something, I was in the past, I could become in the future. But I high fived her and told her she was, I agree. I agree with you. I didn't really agree with her, but you don't want to, if somebody puts you down, they're going to use that against you. So I don't want her, her to do that. So. I went ahead and did that, so, yeah, anyway. Yeah, I recognize her name. I never worked with her. Ann Madison, yeah. And then the owner of the, there's a place I went to in the past for the improvisation he passed, of Bud Friedman. That was yeah, quite a place, the improvisation. You have people like, you have a laugh factory, all kinds of places. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, the owner there is still going strong, Jamie Masada, but, you know, both the original owners from the comedy store and, Comedy store too. Course, they, they both passed, you know, Mitchie Shore and Bud Friedman, but right. Yeah, yeah they they single handedly created a lot of a lot of careers and generate a lot of wealth. You know, that's crazy. I think about that. Yeah. What's your typical day as a comic now? What do you what do you, you know when you Well, I try to get up in the morning, uh I don't, I'm not like a big you know, that the whole general uh Stereotype is comedians gonna stay up all night and sleep all day. No, I get up. I get up pretty early. I try to get up by like six or seven. Do some meditating and affirmations and some journaling and stretching and then uh, try to try to do some uh, just kind of block out my day. So you know, work on social media, work on creative projects, business stuff, travel. There's always like travel headaches. You know, you gotta figure out and and just you know the day goes by then try to go get a workout in try to get some you know a little bit of free time yeah it's just i i can't believe people are oh, bored i'm like i don't know i wish i had time to be bored you yeah. know always always something to be something to be happening even on the ship i mean people see you get bored on the ship so now i i kind of come i come up with enough enough stuff to do and um i feel like uh you know, I wish I'd been a little more organized early in my career. I think I'd be farther along than I am. You know, I'm playing a little catch up, trying to get to the next rung. But you know, it happens when it happens. Tell me about you've had you've had many awards, right? Um, of the contests that you've done and competitions and uh, yeah, I've, I've won a couple of contests. Won a couple, got a couple awards, which are great. I did a, a Ventura Comedy Festival 2000. 10 years, 11 years now, it was 2012, I won that, got a record contract out of it, and um, was best of the fest uh, in Burbank on, uh, this past year, which sounds impressive, but I think there was probably like 40 best of the fests out of the three or 300 people they had on stage. I think like 10, 12% of us got selected, which is still an honor, you know, but um, when I was uh, touring in uh the uh, tribal casinos, well, I still do, but I, mean, I was touring with the group Powell Comedy Jam. We were the National Indian Gaming Association Entertainers of the Year. So that was a good award. You know, they don't really mean that much, but sometimes they'll open some doors for work. Yeah, so that's nice to be uh, recognized and and be able to, to recognize and monetize, say. Yeah. 
There you go. You're doing both. You get recognized and monetized. That's phenomenal. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> so it must be rewarding. It must be very rewarding. A lot of work, but it's rewarding, right? Yeah. But if you didn't, if you didn't love what you're doing, you wouldn't be doing it. You love it. To do what you like, you know. Maybe. Throw your mind, heart, body, and soul into what you're doing. Of course. You know, like you can't please everybody. It's impossible to please everybody, of course. Like Ricky Nelson said in the garden bar, you can't please everybody, please yourself. You're going to yep. throw rotten eggs at him because he wasn't seeing his earlier popular hits. Yeah. So he did garden party. Yeah, that's the one thing I tell people. It's different. Like comedy is very different from music. Because in music, people want to hear the same music over and over when they go to a concert. They want the greatest right. hits. They want the highlights. Maybe I have a couple of um, new stuff. But hmm. if you don't play the classics, they'll turn on you. Comedy, they don't want to hear the same jokes. They want new jokes every time. So you gotta be you gotta be innovative. You gotta be creative and come up with new. new well, I'm fortunate enough that I'm I'm not that famous. If I repeat some jokes, it's not the end of the world. I try to come up with new stuff. But whereas a Bill Burr or a Gabriel Iglesias, they gotta throw the whole all the other stuff just goes by the wayside. But some comedians do come, combine comedy with music. Is that something you've done or you may, or you may want to do? I've got a couple of like things I want to do with that. Yeah. It's, uh, but uh, not like in a huge chunk of time, just a couple little bits. I see. Yeah, I have one where I talk about uh, now, you know, if you watch during the, during the pandemic, I watched way too much news. It was depressing. The commercials were depressing because all of them are medical pill commercials with some rock anthem from back when I was a teenager. It's now the soundtrack of the pill commercial. So that's, that'll make you feel old. Like if uh, you're suffering from erectile dysfunction, uh, ask your doctor if Cialis might be right for you. Take <laughs> care of business every day. Take <laughs> care of business. My ED's gone away. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> that's, that's, that's funny. It's entertaining. Yeah. <laughs> you're taking care of business, all right. That was always his model, TCB, taking care of business. They had that song, of course, taking care of business. Yeah. 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 That's phenomenal. That's what I'd like to do. I'd like to I'll probably go make plans to go see Graceland. I've never been there. I'd like to go there later, later on the year. Yeah. That'd be something. Did you like the Elvis movie? Yes, I did. What did you think of it? I like the, I like the Elvis character. That, that Colonel Tom, was, the Tom Hanks. Oh, Tom Hanks played the role of, uh, did a great job playing the role of uh, Colonel Tom Parker. And that, accent, was that, that accent just drove me up the wall. It was It was just like Nails on a chalkboard. I, obviously, he probably nailed it. Maybe he listened to audio. He probably sounded just like the guy. You talking I, about? What are you talking I about? I didn't know Colonel Tom Parker was was a was a, a, a non wasn't American, but he was a foreign born. Per- I thought he was like some guy from the South. I thought it was a like Colonel Tom Parker. I Tom Parker. No, I didn't know. Was he in the German army or something? That accent. He uh, he was Tom a colonel. He wasn't. He was. He, he was. Uh, a foreigner, Tom Parker. He wasn't. He wasn't from the United States. I, think I know. Well, and that's what I was asking. I don't know if it, you know yeah. he's Colonel Tom Parker. If he was, see, Colonel Tom Parker made sure Elvis. That's why he never got a chance to go to Europe. You know, dude, he had him on lockdown. He was Dutch. He was Dutch. He was from Holland. Yeah, uh, uh, that explains it. Yeah. Right, and so he wasn't legal, and so that's why he did not want Elvis to go tour. He never got a chance to tour in Europe because of that. And he oh, because Elvis was, I mean, because Colonel Tom wasn't supposed to be in the country then. He was a, right, right. He was illegal. He was illegal. I mean, I didn't know this. I, was that, did they make that apparent in the movie or did you just research it? No, I knew that. I knew that. I did research on it. That's huge. I, I don't, is that common knowledge? Oh, yeah. You look at anything about Parker, you're going to find it. Also, Tar- Parker took more money for, than, as a manager than anybody else. He took 50% of all of his earnings. So he wasn't yeah, he, was a, he was a gambling addict, right? Right, right. He used to be, uh, have big gamb- uh, big bill, you know, gamble, gambling debts, and that's that's why he liked Elvis because Elvis performed and he was able to pay off those big gambling debts. But oh, I actually, got locked into that contract. Hey, I'll get locked into a Vegas contract if uh, my manager runs up gambling debts. So you know, when you think of that song, "We're Caught in a Trap," we can't can't walk out. Uh, he was uh, caught in a trap, Elvis. He was caught, and then he had to do these performances to keep it going, even if at times he didn't feel good. Like there were some times when, when Parker would say, go ahead and perform anyway, even if you're not feeling well. Let's see, so Parker was a, he knew how to promote, but he was taking advantage of Elvis, he really was. Yeah, I don't think that had happened in this day and age. There's too many other uh, right. and attorneys and advisors. And 
I thought that the uh, guy who played Elvis did a great job, Austin Butler. He did a great job. He got nominated. Oh yeah, he won. He won the uh, People's Choice Awards. Yeah, he won. He got a shot for the Emmy. Are they he got a chance at the Oscar. He does have a chance, not a guarantee, but a chance. But it's it's tragic about well, Lisa Marie Presley passing. That was very tragic. Yeah, fifty three or something. Yeah, it's only fifty four. She, in fact, her birth birthday would have been a couple of days ago. She would have been fifty five. But um, she had problems. I mean, it wasn't just being married and divorced with different you know people. But um, when she lost her she lost her son to suicide. That's the thing I think that really uh, just rather broke the camel's back. That really hurt her. And she never. She always felt like she was responsible for that, so she felt terrible about that. All right. So that's sad. She only knew you know, her, she lost her father when she was nine years old. But she had a lot of tragedies in her life. But, I mean, before she died, I mean, she did, you know, she went to Graceland that day, and she said, and then people were saying, I love you. We love you, Lisa. She said, I love you back. This gives me a, an excuse to go out. She said, I'm really, I'm not kidding. And she really loved doing that. And then she went, you know, when the People's Choice of the Wars that night, but two days later, when her heart stopped twice, that was it. That was very tragic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have seen other Elvis movies, too. I've seen the real one with him and other, other impersonators. But that was well done. I have the DVD, in fact, of that, of that movie, that Elvis movie. But anyway, um, getting back to you now, um, you've done a lot of things, that's for sure. Well, tell me about, tell me about your television uh, television performances. Have you done TV? Have you done any movies? Talk to me about um, that. Uh, I've done a couple of commer local commercials. That's about it. Uh, I did some background on some movies, like on Westworld, HBO Westworld series. And then I think I got edited. They stood the back of me. We're, they were, we're all in buckskin and had a, had actually had hair extensions because my hair was short at the time. Mm -hmm. And they uh, got, I got paid an extra like $25 by the, for uh, non-union hair extensions. Yeah. Everything oh, well. was all categorized. But uh, I've been on uh, Showtime and then uh, Amazon Prime. I'm on there right now with my uh, uh, set from uh, First Nations Comedy Experience. And then I have Dry Bar Special, Dry Bar Comedy. It's the largest uh, uh, producer of clean comedy in the world. So uh, that's it's got like six, seven million hits on that. So that's nice. Phenomenal. There was a TV show in the past called Make Me Laugh. You remember that one? Vaguely. Yeah. Uh, I know that, um, what's his name? I think Bruce Baum used to be on that a lot. You remember, you ever heard of the name Bruce Baum? Sounds familiar. Yeah. And then, uh, Vic Dunlap, who just died a couple of years ago, not just, might have been five or six years now. Yeah. Vic Dunlap is on there. Yeah. He was a very funny guy. So a lot of those shows, you don't see that now. There's no, you know, there's one or two platforms that kind of elevate you, but you get a late night credit now, it means nothing. And there was a moment of someone else, his name was Clay. He used to do hickory dicky dickory dog jokes. Andrew Dice Clay, yeah. Andrew Dice Clay, that's the one, yeah. 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 Except some of these, some of them get to be too a little full of profanities. That I don't care for when they when they get involved in too many profanities. I like to keep it clean. <laughs> yeah. My mom always said work clean or you cuss, I'll wash your mouth out with soap. Yeah, okay. <laughs> right. Well, I know that. Uh, that's what I try to do. I try to actually Actually, um, you know, if, if somebody's talking about certain things are political, that's fine. I, I try to keep it away from things like that. Like Elvis, you know, he, he was uh, asked about social issues and everything. Uh, the Vietnam protesters or uh, women's liberation that time. It was in uh, Madison Square Garden in New York. He says, honey, I don't get involved in those. I stay away from those topics. I'm certainly an entertainer. And that's how I feel the same thing. Try to stay away. You know, you open up a can of worms and you get into those kind of topics. Too much political or too much religion or social talk and comics. But I know a comedian though talks about that certain things. That's a different story because well, if you're a political great. comedian, especially if you're just you're like a a relationship comedian, then you just go off on a political tangent. You're going to throw people all off, you know. Right. My my style is I cut. I do a lot of categories. I'll do observation, relationship, some stories, some politics, some. Uh, I don't do too much religion, but. You know, pets, uh, you know, I try to give it a, a whole comedy, comedy buffet, I call it, you know. Sounds good. So, in other words, you got variety. Yeah. You know, uh, you yeah, I mean, I think it's for a good and bad. I mean, you might have less of a distinct voice because I kind of jump around on topics where some people have that common theme all the way through. So, yeah. Do you do like meet and greets now at your, at your, at your shows? Do you do meet and greets? 
Yeah, generally, you know, sometimes it's an official thing where they put you in a room, people pay extra, and then sometimes it's just stand outside after and shake hands and talk people up. And I think it's good to engage with the fans and with people, you know, why not? Why they not? Pay, yeah, why they not? Pay that money, let them have the full experience, you know. I'm even I'm no one famous, but at least they can say, well, we got to thank him for the show. We got to share some commonality. We have a friend that we both know, whatever the deal is. You know. No, it's good, it's good PR. It's good public relations. And it is. I was really impressed that Fluffy Gabriel Iglesias, I remember when he, before he really, really blew up, he was already doing well. He went to, uh, he was at the uh, Silver Legacy in Reno, and I live in that area. Went to the show. And he stood around. We were going to talk to him afterward. He he probably took three hours, a good two, three hours after the show, after he worked his butt off on stage to take a picture with every fan. Wow. That's pretty neat. smart. To get the picture, it was his camera, and they had to go onto his website. So, well, yeah, by doing that, that shows he cares about and loves his fans. So in return, he's going to promote, and people are going to be attracted to him. Yeah, they're, going to have to, they're going to have to get on his mailing list or do whatever they have to do to get their photo. That makes that's sense. What a great way to drive him to the website. There's no ch- no cost. You know, he's not giving away a CD or a T-shirt or anything. Yeah, I think that's great. That really is great, Mark. Yeah. yeah. How do you go about right now writing comedy? Now that takes a special talent. It's like just like doing comedy, standing up and standing up and doing comedy. Uh, um, I actually, I actually I had an, I had another I had another comedian on my show by the name of Don Grabowski. And she sits in a wheelchair, but she does it. She sits down, but she's very entertaining. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. But she's, she's, I think so. Yeah. And yeah, she was entertaining. She was fun. Yeah. But anyway, um, how about as far as, um, I'm just trying to think thing. what I was going to say about, um, oh, yeah, about writing comedy. That takes a special talent. So how do you, what are your techniques for uh, being funny and for writing comedy and, how do you uh, and how do you handle if you if you get a writer's block and you know how do you go about doing that? It's 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 super um, inconsistent for me. I'll come up with streaks, roll just tons of stuff, it's a little momentum, and then or I'll just have like this dead time where my brain's not working. I try not to overthink it. You know, I just I'll start writing in the morning. I just let the pen go, and I might write three pages, nothing to do with comedy, or it might be a whole bunch of topics. Eventually, I know I just have that faith that is all floating around out here in the universe that it's going to basically it's going to come in to my head at some point i'm going to get some more jokes yeah i don't well, know I, I don't set a time frame on it i just say it's gonna it's happening and, I and I'll, I'll go through and look at my material i like a spreadsheet and i'll go through read it and then i'll touch up the joke and move this and that and i kind of build the, you get the foundation and add the building blocks to make it tighter and change some of the words yeah, add a new joke in the middle of it. So. so there's no special, you have any secrets at all about how to be successful in writing and writing jokes? You just have your own style, pretty much. I wouldn't even call it a style. It's just kind of a uh, a, a non-processed process, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> my process is no process. It's like I'll write, I'll kind of keep my eye and and stuff comes to my head, the key thing is to get it on the phone or write it down right away. And if you get a writer's block, you can't think of it. What do you do? You just uh, sometimes you have to let it go. And this, that, that's that pinfall. Like, oh man, that joke killed last night. I don't remember it. Yeah. Like the song, let it go, let it go. <laughs> All right, that makes sense. Try to get involved in something else and just forget about it. Yeah. And if you, if you can't think of something, maybe it'll come to mind later. Right? So much of it is about space that I've learned. Is like I thought it was always just push, push, push. Right, right, right. Sometimes it's just letting your brain relax and let it come to you, you know. And the same for comedy probably is timing. I'm sure it's besides being uh, different and funny, it's timing. Well, you got to make it work in the act, especially if you're, if you have a timing of a, a cadence and a flow. And now I want to put that new joke in the middle there. And I want to change that word out. And then you got to get it out a few times and get it comfortable and not kind of domino on the other jokes where they're coming across as a little bit jilted, you know. What's the, what's the biggest and greatest challenge you've ever had as a comedian? you have any? Probably just busting into the next level. You know, it's just hard to get to the to the higher up the food chain. Because, you know, I don't have good man. You know, I, was saying, I don't have good management. I don't have super powerful management. 
my agent passed away from COVID during the pandemic. Well, I'm serving her about that. My condolences. So I never really got a chance to have him well, fully, you know, go after stuff. So yeah, that's the biggest challenge is staying relevant and getting, getting the opportunities. So you, you're your own agent then, it sounds like. You promote yourself then. I have, well, I have a manager. I have a ship agent that books me on the cruises. Oh. Exclusive with them. But land, yeah. I'm, you know, I booked this brewery gig here in Omaha. A friend, a friend and her husband had done it. So I asked them, hey, do you have any contact info? It's just sometimes you just glean from out and about and put a little tour together and call oh. it good. Well, shout out to, to uh, podcastguest.com. That's how we find out about you, my producer and I. Yeah. Reached out to them. We saw it and he looked very interesting and decided to go forward. Well, hopefully I uh, didn't, didn't uh, bore too many people, you know, with my. No, no, you're not boring. <laughs> Thank Well, that, no, I appreciate you having me on. It was fun. Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no problem at all. Uh, I do want to. I want to ask you one. I do want to go into real fast. I want to ask you about your podcast. You do have a podcast. You're a podcast host. I did. How did that happen? You still do it? How does that happen? It's kind of been on hiatus. I, I was interviewing all these crazy record holders. I really liked it, but I just was having trouble with, uh, you know, after the pandemic, I'm going to go to work, and my dad cool. got sick. But I, re- I would inter- interview wannabe record holders, should be record holders, actual record holders, like the. This XDA agent who was like the, he did uh, uh, burpees position for eight hours and something minutes. Oh. Burp, you know, the burpees around your elbows. Oh. Then I had another lady I interviewed. She had the world record for a number of wings eaten in, in an hour. She ate like 530 something wings in one hour. Oh. Mother of four. And then next guy trying to become the worst world's worst Uber driver. And another guy that, uh, Robbed multiple banks. He ended up not saying how many, but that was that was super interesting. Yeah. So I mean, I'd, I'd like to bring it back. I just I don't I don't know if it's me and I'm not organized enough or I'm doing too much, but I just haven't found the time. Oh, I got you. So you're so busy as a comic, doing your stand up and also writing comedy. You don't, you don't have you don't have right now the time to do it, but you enjoyed it in the past. What you're telling me, you may bring it back. Oh, yeah. I would I would love to do that. I like writing you know treatments. I've run, written a couple screenplays. I haven't sold anything yeah. yet. Got some reality show ideas. I'm trying to pitch those out. So yeah, really okay. Um, yeah, almost, well, you know, I'm the almost famous guy right there in the play. Almost so, famous, yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's a there was somebody that said that about being famous. I'm trying to think if I can remember now. Um, it was an artist by the name of Andy Warhol. That's the one. He said we all have 15 minutes of fame. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah, he's coined that term, right? That didn't exist before he did that. Right. But what you do with your fame is what counts. You know, because that can be fame can be uh, very vanishing, you know, very temporary, right? Okay. Especially in this day and age, yeah. And there's right. so much bells and whistles and people distracted. So yeah. oh, of course. Um I do want to I want to I want to ask you some other things. If you had anything to do anything over again in your life and your career, would you do anything differently? Hmm. Um, probably originally I would have stayed in LA and probably worked in a writing, you know, got, got a job at a studio or something instead of my buddy and I are trying to write a screenplay and then just hanging out in Northridge and his apartment trying to write, write instead of networking and meeting people and working as an assistant or an intern in a, you know, a production company or something. So that was not very strategic. So I would say that. And then, uh, okay. uh, how do you handle rejection? You know, and, you know, especially entertainment and people get rejected. How do you, how do you handle it? Depending depends what the opportunity is. If it's something I wasn't that you know, just threw it out there, a comedy club in or Florida or something like that. Big deal. Next one. It's when it gets tougher is when that like, you get rejection, you're trying to get on a, a bigger show or change your payday, you know, ask for a raise. That can be that can be a big reaction, yeah. So you just do your best, that's all, I guess. That's it. Yeah. Move right on. You don't. I don't sit there and roll upon it. No, that doesn't help you any. Right. Like, well, if somebody cancels on me, I can't sit there and no one's going to feel sorry for me. Well, it didn't pan out. Move right on to the next one, next project, next. <laughs> That's what you got to do. You're right. Do you have any present projects, um, Mark, at all that you're working on in comedy? Hmm. Well, I'm trying to write, write a new uh, 40 minute. I'm trying to do two things, like a, a 40 minute COVID set about what we went through, and then a general like. 45, 55 
stand-up comedy and no real discussion of COVID. Interesting. I'd like to do a whole like retrospective on it, but a funny one, and then see. Any future dream projects that you haven't done yet that you really like to do? Well, I like to teach comedy in prison. I have a, a plan, a, writing a treatment, like a lesson plan, which is uh, 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 what did I say, uh, comedy, comedy, incarcerated comedy, and then I had another name for it, uh, comedians. Uh, Comedians in custody or something like that. I don't remember. Yeah. So I do like the idea of doing that and give back to some of these guys because they say pain, uh, comedy comes from pain. So like who suffered more than a lot of, you know. I see. Maybe you'll do a documentary about yourself. I once thought of an idea. I don't know how the money it means to produce it, but you know how difficult it is to make it in show business. So the idea would be a movie about struggling actors and actresses, how to get rejected without even trying. <laughs> you know, it'd be a comedy. Showing people struggling, you know, with their managers and agents. And you're just a cattle call. You know, you're just another number and they want to make money. And that's how they treat, a lot of times they treat their clients. Yeah. And you're, you can be at the bottom of the food chain, even yeah. in your in your boutique agency or the top of the food chain. So people right. think, oh, I got a manager now, I got an agent. That's not going to move the needle. It's still you. You're the one that is, is winding the clock up. So Now, if people want to find out more about you, uh, Mark, Mark, you have me, how do they go about doing that? They go to the Sparks Police Department uh, website or a uh, known uh, criminal. No. Go to uh, my website is laughwithmark.com, M A R C, my parents couldn't spell. So laugh with Mark. And that has a link to my Facebook. They can follow me on Facebook, an Instagram link, a t- Twitter. Um, I'm on uh, the TikTok. Yeah, I'm helping the communist Chinese. Uh, so the TikTok is actually my biggest social media platform. You're on IMDb, aren't you? On IMDb? I haven't kept my account active, but I think, I don't know if like this new movie I'm, I'm, you know, this new project I'm working on, hopefully it'll end up, you know, on there. And uh, I think I have some TV credits from the past that are on there, you know, Comics Unleashed. And So you might be in a, you might be in a movie, it sounds like. Huh? Well, working on it. Yeah. We'll see what happens. So. Hope it works out for you. Okay. Yeah, it's not really, I was starting to. Blah, and you're blah. on, and you're on, uh, you're also on Facebook, right? Okay. Facebook, Instagram, yeah, I, I'm pretty Facebook. I'm active, yeah. So I have a regular page, uh, my my personal page, and I have um, a fan page. Laugh, uh, Mark, Facebook, laugh with Mark Yaffe. I see. Yeah. So, but you know what? What we're gonna we're gonna do, um, Mark? We have we're uh, ladies and gentlemen. We're you have a, a real treat with Mark Yaffe. Uh, we have a. What we're going to do, it's showtime now on the Amazing Rich and Johnny Blaze show. It's called uh, the Laffy with Yaffy uh, show. And we're going we're gonna to show different uh, comedy bits from Mark. You're going to hear and see uh, different comedy bits. So uh, the first one was about, it was a jacuzzi. I think you had a jacuzzi one. I was doing jokes in the jacuzzi for a while. In the jacuzzi. That's right. Let's do, the, let's do that. Let's play that first, Mark. A pandemic uh, attempt to stay, stay funny. Yeah. And I want I want all of our people, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to have a blazing hot fun time listening to Mark Yaffe. As he, I, I need to do my disclaimer. These jokes are from like 2020, 21. So I didn't just write them. They were very they were very topical at the time. Oh, I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Hope you guys all had a great weekend. Uh, I did a live show up in uh, Klamath Falls, Oregon. Uh, that was it, yeah, indoors too, socially distanced, more or less. Yeah, and I was trying to keep my distance. But yeah, Oregon, goofy state. I went to a Clown Falls, Oregon. Oregon, uh, only state in America with uh, uh, full service fueling and assisted suicide. Yeah, they'll, uh, they'll let you uh, turn off your oxygen tank, but they won't let you uh, fill up your gas tank. Well, I don't know if you guys have been to Oregon. Uh, goofy state, yeah, Oregon. Uh, Oregon, it's, 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 if you ever look at a map of Oregon, I don't know who the hell came up with their map. Hey, Peaches, hey, Ellen. Uh, yeah, in Oregon, they have uh, a, a bend in the middle of the state. They got uh, North Bend on the southwest coast. They got Island City up in the high desert. Whoever wrote that Oregon map spent way too much time in Zigzag, Oregon, which there actually is. Yeah. So, in Oregon, it's the cities, they have like duplicate names. I'm like Oregon, can't you come up with your own names? In Oregon, they got a, there's a Salem, there's a Detroit, there's a Glendale, there's Phoenix, Oregon. 
there's an Oakland, Oregon. Yeah. <clears throat> Oakland, California, you're in the hood. Oakland, Oregon, they are wearing the hood. Uh, man, let's, let's go over. Uh, yeah, I love Oregon, man. Uh, I wrote some, some new topical jokes. I've been working on some topical stuff just because, uh, I don't know, there's just so much crap going on in the news. So uh, you guys might have read that uh, a Russian political activist, uh, a guy by the name of Alexei Navalny, was deliberately poisoned. President Trump told reporters he would have no comment until after Vladimir Putin, Putin tells him what to say. Um, man was jailed for punching a Picasso painting in a museum. Yeah, jailed for punching a Picasso painting. Uh, the assault was uh, witnessed by an alert Rembrandt self-portrait and uh, the Mona Lisa. They had a big outbreak in a corona, uh, a coronavirus outbreak in a main jail. It was traced back to a wedding that infected at least 60 guests. Uh, so yeah, infected at least 60 people. Reminder that jailhouse uh, marriages usually don't work out well. Uh, Hussein Bolt, uh, Jamaican Hussein Bolt, contacted, uh, contracted COVID-19 after his big birthday bash. But the gold medal sprinter said he's already recovered uh, from the virus in a world record 19.7 seconds. And they had the uh, Republican National Convention last week. Uh, Tiffany Trump uh, spoke at the convention saying, she, I can relate to Americans looking for a job. I applied for a job at my dad's company six months ago, and I'm still waiting for an interview. Uh, the professors from President Trump's uh, college board mm -hmm. are demanding a, a, a probe into the claim that uh, Trump cheated on his SATs. Uh, President Trump said he'd like to share the results of his 1967 SAT scores, but they're still under routine audit. Other coronavirus uh, news, Texas health officials issued a warning saying uh, uh, a warning uh, was issued after a spike in people in Texas ingesting bleach. Texas officials reminded uh, Texas residents, y'all know better, to take lasso for COVID and bleach for sunburn. University of Arizona actually prevented corona outbreak virus on campus by testing waste water. Yeah. Campus spokesman, spokesman replied, it took him a few days, but we figured our shit out. Jared Kushner, president's son-in-law, commented on the uh, NBA racial justice strike, saying NBA players are, uh, quote, unquote, fortunate they can take the night off from work. Kushner added, when I was a kid, our servants never got a night off from work. And some university in Germany is actually offering fine arts scholarships to three people to do absolutely nothing. So far, nearly 789,000 top candidates haven't bothered to apply. Uh, over in Europe and Asia, they're going to have the world's longest bus route, which will connect London, England with New Delhi, India. So they're going to have the world's longest bus route collect London to New Delhi launching next year, but the uh, MTA bus from Far Rockaway, Queens to Times Square will still take 20 minutes longer. The Border Patrol agents uh, seized over $1 million worth of cocaine on the Florida beach. No one has been arrested in connection yet, but authorities expect uh, several dead suspects will turn up soon. CNN listed 19 things you can do that you can buy on Amazon. 19 little things you can buy on Amazon to make a big difference. Uh, but somehow they failed to make, to make the, failing to make the list where Jeff Bezos' uh, credit card number and three digit uh, security code. Yeah, man, I, it's been a rough week. You know, a lot of sad stuff going on. Uh, uh, protest shootings, uh, Black Panther star, uh, Chad Bo Bozeman died. Times have changed, yeah. This is, you think back America, man, we went from back in the day, we had like uh, Roosevelt, we have nothing to fear, but fear itself. And Kennedy, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what, or ask not what you can, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. So now we have like, I did not have sex with that woman and grabbed by the hoo -hoo. We went from I have a dream to I have a wet dream. In America, we used to be inspired to vote for a candidate or for a cause. Now we're manipulated to vote against a candidate or against a cause, right? You see now we got all the election commercials are coming around, uh, state races, federal races, local races. Just watch those commercials. It's always that sinister voice. Uh, Steve Sisolak wants to be governor of the state of Nevada. But what do we really know about Steve Sisolak? Fact. Steve Sisolak 
Mike has been to the state of Hawaii five times. Fact. Barack Hussein Obama is from Hawaii. Fact. Steve Sisolak once ate Italian food in San Francisco. Fact. Nancy Pelosi is an Italian from San Francisco. Obama, Pelosi, and Sisolak. A dangerous alliance we can't afford. Paid for by a coalition of firefighters, seniors, and prescription drug abusers. And I'm real guilty of this. Now we get on Facebook, we get on social media. We want to try to change people's mind, no matter how passionate or how factual your uh, or well-crafted your political social media post is. You're never going to convert a political friend of me to your side, all right? But Jehovah Witness has a better chance of converting a convent full of nuns than you do converting a political opponent to your team with a Facebook post. A Bernie Bros man bun will spontaneously combust before you convince him to support the border wall. A, a Trump supporter will drown himself in a vat of vegan chocolate before they'd agree to sign on for Medicare for all. A climate change deniers trailer would have to be sideswiped by an iceberg before you can convince them global warming might be a real problem. I think man-made climate change deniers, they, to everyone else, you're like the, you guys are the lung cancer deniers of the 1950s and 60s. So, like, what do you mean, sir? It's caused lung cancer? People smoked for thousands of years before people, anyone even invented the term lung cancer? There's no way my doctor could be 100% sure that smoking three packs a day caused lung cancer. It's just the doctors and government trying to scare us so they can raise our taxes and control our lives. I don't know. I don't know. What else? Sounds great. Well, the, the jokes were a little old, but that was just what Problem I worked work. on. I forgot about, you know, I did a lot of writing during the COVID. It's been a pleasure having you on, Mark. Yeah, uh, you've been a delightful guest. It's been very fun and entertaining, and I've really enjoyed it. Time's gone by really fast, Mark. And I just want to I just want to say, uh, in wrapping up, to all my fans and friends, always keep a smile on your face and a song in your heart. Until next time, happy trails. And blaze out. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to be a guest on an entertainment talk show, please send us an email at amazingoriginaljbshow at gmail.com. All of our episodes will appear on YouTube and Facebook and receive over 3,000 views. Don't forget to sign up for our YouTube channel, and we, every guest will receive a complimentary DVD of their appearance on the show. Remember, we are much better than a podcast. And now, the amazing, original Johnny Blaze has just left the building. Good night. God bless. <laughs>